What do you attribute Buddy's huge success lately to having come out of the, the West Side clubs? And well, he's a hell of a guitar player, I guess. I, I, when I'm listening to blues, I listen to the singing. But he's a good guitar player. And a lot of white blues fans barely listen to the voice. I mean, I think it's nice that they appreciate Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters, who are not great guitar players. The voice, so it's not quite as true as, as I say, but mm -hmm. I think his guitar playing is what attracts the attention. Uh, there are uh, singers on Delmark who are not great guitar players, and I won't name any names, I don't think, uh, but they're great singers. Mm -hmm. And I record, I record, I want to hear a guy sing. You know, I, I, we, we recorded you partly because you. You're white and you don't sing, because most of the white guys who sing, they're either doing a blackface act or they just sound callow. And you, you let me record an all-instrumental record, too. And you you got great taste in singers, too. Uh, you mentioned Charlie, and you, just yeah. to clarify, talking about Charlie sure. Musselwhite, yeah. who used to work for you here at the he Jazz Record. He worked in the store, yeah. Yeah, and f famous stories about Big Joe Williams, the great country blues man from Mississippi, living, yeah. living in the basement here. This, yeah, was this he, back in the 60s? Yeah, he had a key to the basement at 7 West. Uh, and whenever he was in town, he'd park his car out on the street. There was no, they certainly didn't have 24-hour meters then <laughs> like they do now. And they didn't even have meters. I mean, this neighborhood, almost every building out there has been built since, yeah. except the one we're in. Right. It's been built since I moved right. in the neighborhood. And you were originally right around the corner from here. Yeah, we were at Grand and State, yeah. 7 West Grand, and bigger space and 12 West Grand, 11 West Grand. We interviewed John Hammond uh, about a month ago. And oh, he, really? And he talked about coming here in the 60s with Mike Bloomfield. Bloom, yeah. Bloomfield would tell him, this is the place you got to go. And, and he yeah. told these stories of just being in awe of coming here and, and meeting Big Joe and couldn't believe that yeah. he was living here. I, I love it when New Yorkers come to the store and, and sometime I'll walk up and say, well, you, surely you must have a bigger store than this in New York. <laughs> no, we don't. Well, one of the reasons they can't afford the rent. <laughs> your, your feelings about who, really, who, who, who the king of Chicago blues really is, when most people think it's muddy, you, you would always tell me that, that you got to go back even further to Big Bill Brunsey. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit I know, about I'm not about sure we have Bill. a king. Right. Uh, you know, just picking one guy to lead. I mean, it's true about B.B., isn't it? But, uh, yeah, Brunsey is the forgotten man. I mean, he's given some credit because uh, he, he caught the white eyes with his records on folkways. Uh, but Bill Brunsey was a tremendous songwriter. I mean, if you get a record by Jazz Gillum or Washboard Sam, and it's credited to Gillum or Sam, it's almost certain, and I, I would say it's, dead, it's definitely certain to have been written by Brunsey. Mm -hmm. They were relations of some sort, and, and he'd write a song, he gave Key to the Highway to Jazz Gillum. Then he took it back <laughs> when he recorded it. A year or two later. Uh, and Key to the Highway is a classic. I mean, you probably still do it once in a while. Sure. Yeah. But he wrote an awful lot of others. There are other yeah. songwriters who don't get the credit they deserve as songwriters. And another one is Roosevelt Sykes. He wrote Driving Wheel in the 30s. Nighttime is the Right Time, just to name a, 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 a few. Mm -hmm. And he didn't write 44 Blues, which was his big hit. He, he never claimed to write that. He said, oh, I got that from Lee Green, and I got that from some three or four other piano players. Put them together. He did a recording of Sweet Home Chicago and added one of the commonly heard verses hmm. when he recorded for Imperial in 1951. But he's a piano player, so nobody knows about him. Yeah. Everybody wants to hear a guitar player. I think it's kind of sad. I'm glad there's at least one piano player who's making a pine top. Yeah. Um, in addition to talking about Big Joe, some of the other great country blues men you recorded include Sleepy John Estes, Big Boy Crudup, yeah. and uh, 
I wanted to mention one more, Sleepy John. Well, it didn't do that many country guys. Uh, in fact, we still haven't issued a record by, I don't think we have, uh, a guy who's kind of like Dr. What's-His-Name in New Orleans. Dr. John? No, Dr. John? Dr. John in New Orleans? No, no, no. Uh, a De I'm sorry, a Detroit guy. Oh. Dr. something. And this guy is very much like him. He plays washboard and guitar. We did a record years ago on spec, and I've had trouble finding him or his the guy who promoted the deal so we could issue it. Mm -hmm. and I forget his name, so that's not much help, is it? There, you got the you got it all. You got all the facts right there. Everything I know about the guy. When 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 tourists come into your was, store, new customers who are looking to, to get hip to more blues, and they ask you for advice, give us an idea of what you what you tell them to check out, what records you tell them to listen to. Well, I, I, I like to get them into that pre-war stuff. If they're really interested in the whole story of blues, a lot of guys sort of follow a, an unwritten rule that Blind Lemon Jefferson came to Chicago and taught Muddy Waters how to play guitar or something. You know, it's something. They, they skipped that whole period of the 30s, and I think I have to blame Sam Chartis for that because he, he dismissed the whole 30s period in a chapter called Bluebird Blues and his wonderful book, otherwise wonderful book, Country Blues. And there's this concept that, oh, that was just, you know, going commercial, you know, adding a New Orleans bass player to a guitar and washboard and harp. That's why he ignored the bl Bluebird Records. Yeah. yeah, well, he calls it the Bluebird Sound, but the same guy, Lester Melrose, was, was producing, directing the uh, Vocalion and OK in Columbia Records. In fact, he was with Vocalion uh, from the early 30s. Uh, and and some I, of the artists they, that they recorded? Well, they did Big Bill, uh, Delmark Artist first, Big Joe Williams, Curtis <laughs> Jones. <laughs> Let's get them in. Uh, Tampa Red. It, it didn't get to Sykes until the early 40s. Tampa, Tampa Red, Jazz Gillum, More Sports Sam. Uh, well, Tampa Red's another hugely important figure in early Chicago blues. Can oh, we yeah. Talk about him for a while? Well, he goes back to the late 20s when he recorded for Vocalion. And what the heck was his hit? How, not How Long Blues. I know, I know he did Let Me Play With Your Poodle. Well, yeah, that was later. <laughs> uh, Temple is a unique guitar player. I don't think anybody else sounds at all like him. I, nobody yeah. I've heard. Huge slide influence and, and, on people. And, like. and one of the reasons that he did a lot of records, he was a good songwriter, too. Right. I mean, Lester Melrose, who did the uh, Bluebirds and the OKs and the Vocalions, the Columbias and the Victors, was a music publisher. He was interested in artists who wrote songs. Mayo Williams at DECA had been a music publisher, but he wasn't allowed to publish the stuff that DECA artists did. So he'd buy the artist's share. So he was interested in guys who wrote songs. And there are probably some really great blues artists who never got recorded because they didn't write songs. And I mm -hmm. think that's pathetic, but I think that's possibly, probably the case. Uh, but both, all three labels, and there were only three companies then doing blues, there were only three major companies, uh, had a steady stream of blues records coming out, uh, and gospel. Who was buying blues records in the 30s and 40s? Well, m not very many white people, I guarantee you that. Yeah. There was one guy in Evanston, we bought his record collection, we had to write a second check when we, because it was already, everything was packed up, we just sort of spot checked it. This is a white guy in Evanston who apparently was buying blues records from 1938 on. It was a great collection. We had to write a second check to the estate. Uh, actually, they thought some 10-inch LPs were 78s, and they were, his taste was into prestige and blue notes, mm -hmm. so it was the third check when we found those. Uh, but generally, it was, uh, of course, black people. They were called race records until the mid-40s. This was a term that was suggested to the record industry in 1921 by the NAACP. 
after World War II, they thought the word race had become, as I've heard it be in, in some stories, uh, a put down. So they suggested some get you know let's get something else, and they said, well, we have. If we say rhythm, that'll include the gospel music, and if we say blues, that'll emphasize the biggest part of the catalog. And that's where the term rhythm and blues came from. 1946, I believe it was. They didn't make call them race records anymore. Hmm. 